Hello, I'm Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chain enjoys bringing you the latest. Uh, Chain enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls and webinars. Science serves publications and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Chain Partnership webinar, which is titled "Silicones and Food Contact Material." Our moderator today is Karen Wang, director of the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q and A session. You may type in questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our panelists to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who call in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 30 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Karen. Great, thank you so much, Hannah. Hello, welcome to today's webinar on silicone food contact materials. Silicone products are becoming more and more common, many times as a substitute for plastic or um, for other types of hair that you might be familiar with. Um, they are also found in cosmetics, personal care products, infant and toddler products like teethers, and food packaging. However, there's limited data and scientific understanding of the exposure pathways and health effects for silicone and its different uses. So today, we're really excited to have Dr. Birgit Goyek to present on the topic. Birgit holds a doctorate degree in microbiology from the Heinrich Heine University Dusseldorf. In 2013, she joined the Food Packaging Forum as a scientific officer. The Food Packaging Forum is a nonprofit based in Zurich, Switzerland. The Food Packaging Forum aims to provide independent science-based and balanced information in the areas of chemicals and food contact materials and articles and their impact on our health. So thank you so much, Birgit. We're happy to hear from you today. So thank you so much, Hannah. Can, can you just tell me whether you can hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Okay, you great. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Hannah and Karen, for the invitation and organization of this webinar. It's a pleasure to present here. And um, I'm happy to welcome all of you to this a presentation about silicones and food contact materials. So first of all, uh, let me explain what we mean if we use this maybe not so easy term food contact materials. So we talk about this or in short FCMs if we talk about food packaging, that's the most famous food contact material, but also all other articles which come into contact with food are made of food contact materials. Let it be conveyor belts or other things during production or items you use for storing food in bulk quantities or things you use at home in your kitchen. These are all food contact materials and food contact articles. And um, Karen already introduced the food packaging forum. I also have one short slide telling you what we are mainly doing. So we are a nonprofit organization and we are communicating about all different types of food contact materials and the chemicals these materials are made of. So our focus is on the chemical composition of these um, materials and the migration of these chemicals into food because this could have, or this may have uh, effects on human health, which is sometimes known and often unknown, unknown. So if you're interested in this topic, you can find a lot of information on our websites. We have daily news, we have a, a a bi-monthly newsletter. We have uh, more basic information in the form of a rather simple fact sheet. We have background articles on certain topics. We have more detailed, um, in-depth articles. We call them dossiers. We write scientific publications. We also have an annual workshop and organize webinars. And the recordings of all talks are also online. So if you are interested, just go to our website and check for whatever you are you want to know and all the information is freely available so yeah you're warmly invited to check this 
And here I've mentioned the dossiers. So this I think was the reason why I was invited because um, the dossiers we write about certain food contact chemicals like bisphenol A or also materials like the silicones. And already some years ago, we have published this dossier on silicones. And um, here during this presentation, I will mainly summarize what is written in this quite condensed text and uh, we'll also provide a little bit more recent information because as you see, it's not, not very, very up to date, but the basics didn't change, so don't worry about that. Let me start with some examples um, of silicones in contact with food. So um, Hannah mentioned in her, sorry, Karen mentioned in her introduction that they become more and more frequent. You see a lot of products made of, out of silicones. And the most prominent examples are these uh, kitchen utensils, we call them, like baking molds or spoons or ice cube trays or also bags you can use for transporting your food to work and back or stoppers, gasket ceilings, all these things um, you have probably seen more and more during the last years. But silicones are not only used in kitchen utensils, they are also used in the food industry during production of food. They can be liquid, they are used as lubricating oils in food machines, processing machines, release agents, which are just covering certain surfaces, but also conveyor belts, which are purely made out of silicones. And then again, a lot of small things, which, which are yeah, good to produce them from, from silicones. Silicones are also used in food packaging, but if we talk about food packaging, we mainly talk about the single use food packaging and there I think it's not not affordable to make food packaging out of silicones, but they are used as additives and plastics and also in paper and board packaging. And they're used as a coating, for example, on uh, natural corks and also here you find more applications. Then most of you have probably seen baby soothers or feeding teats made out of uh, silicone. And interestingly, that is very, very direct contact with food. Um, they are used as food additives. So during processing, they are used to prevent foaming. They can be used as a protective layer on fats and oils, or also as additive in cooking spray. So you see the range of applications is very broad, but all of it is is food contact, so that we have to keep in mind. And when I try to get uh, the, the current information about silicones, I just started with a very uh, simple Google search and I was, I started to collect all the different claims that were made um, to promote the use of silicones. You can see them here and I found them, I found it very interesting to read through. Um, so two you see here that um, say that silicones endures for decades unchanged and resists degradation of sun and sea. And together, um, I have to move this now, okay. Um, with the second one telling that it won't degrade into micro fragments into our ocean, in our oceans. That are claims, um, I was wondering whether they are good or bad. And um, so we, I think there would be room for discussion if you if you want to see the advantages or disadvantages of these claims. Then there were others uh, which didn't tell a lot. So silicones are comprised of uh, inert silica, sand and oxygen. Yeah, okay, that um, tells us a little bit, but we are also comprised of mainly carbon and oxygen. So um, that does tell approximately the same amount of information. Um, and then there are other claims which may also not stand up to closer verification. So whether they are eco-friendly or ocean-friendly or less wasteful, I think it's, it's open for discussion. The same is about the rec recyclability or the, the food safety, uh, food safety, excuse me. So I had some open questions after reading this. And um, I thought we, we really may think about the, the information we already have and promote the information we have. And we need to understand the basics of silicone. So we, 
may need to talk about the chemical properties and the areas of application. Then the migration and exposure data, I will explain a little bit more when I come to this, the human and environmental hazards, and also we need to identify knowledge gaps. So let's start with a very basic thing, the chemistry of silicones. Um, silicones are also called polysiloxanes. So if you find this word, it's, it's saying the same, it means the same. And here you see, a, I try to make it simple, but still it looks a little bit complicated. You see a structure of a typical silicone. And in light blue, you have a, the backbone, as it is called. It's um, composed of oxygen and silicon atoms. And then um, to the silicon, there are organic side chains connected or side groups connected. And between the brackets, you see one single functional unit or one monomer. This can be repeated many, many times if you produce a silicon. So there are small silicon molecules. Then the N, the little N you see down there would mean maybe a three or four, then it's just a short molecule of a few repeating units, but it could also be a thousand units. So it would be a huge molecule. And then you see the gray circle. Um, that is also an organic side group which connects one of these short or long backbones to another backbone. So silicones can, only, uh, can also form networks. They can be quite complex molecules in the end. So there are many um, possibility, possibilities to modify a silicone. So you can use different organic side chains, chains or groups which contain carbon. I didn't mention that before. You can use different degrees of cross-linking, so the gray connections between the long molecules, and you can vary the, the length of the molecule. So therefore, you have a lot of different silicones on the market. However, all these molecules have common properties. So they have a high thermal stability. They are, have a low chemical reactivity, so usually not much happens to them if, you, if they get into contact with something else. They are water and oil repellent. They have a high gas permeability, which is interesting if you talk, uh, think about food packaging, because for many purposes, you don't want to have a high gas permeability, but for some you may want, for fruits, for example. Um, they're insoluble in water, in mineral oil, and in alcohol. They can take up hydrophobic molecules, so they can bind other molecules. I found that very interesting. And they can be hydrolyzed by acids or bases also. Okay, I will shortly talk about regulation. Um, I made this slide quite full because I think some of you may be interested and then you have the information, but I'm not going into the details. So since silicones are used as food contact materials, they are regulated in, in some countries, so in the US, they are regulated as indirect food additives by the US FDA under the Code of Federal Regulation um, Title 21. And here you see where you find more information in which parts of the, of the law. They are also used as prior sanctioned, sanctioned ingredients or as substances generally recognized, recognized as safe. In the EU, the picture is a little bit more scattered. So in the EU, the food contact regulation is quite, or is covered by this framework regulation. And um, probably some of you may have heard of Article 3 that, that says that all the materials and arc articles that are used in contact with food, I make it short, they shall be saved. So they shouldn't release any chemical into the food which could harm the, the person who consumes the food. So each silicone should fulfill this requirement. However, there is no harmonized regulation in the EU on silicones, but there are certain national laws or maybe only rec recommendations, non-binding um, regulations, call it, let's call it like this. So uh, in Germany, there is one, in France, there is one. You also find the details in the dossier or if you search for these um, names. The Council of Europe, which is also not, not binding, they published uh, a resolution on the use of silicones in food contact applications in the year 2004. 
And silicones are also, some of them are listed in the EU plastics regulation. So plastics is regulated within the whole EU and um, all chemicals which are allowed to be used during the production of plastics, they are listed in Annex 1. And this list contains six polysiloxanes. That is only a, a small number, but there you can also find them already. Okay, now let's uh, go to the migration from silicones into food. So I, I mentioned this word before, and it was somehow also um, mentioned in the framework regulation. So this means that chemicals are transferred from, in this case, silicones or also other food contact materials into food. That's um, what, you, what you mean when you talk about migration. And there are some typical types of migrants. These are the, the chemical molecules which can, can migrate. And uh, for silicones, siloxane oligomers are one big group of migrants. Also additives and catalysts and also breakdown and reaction products. That's what I've ex extracted from the scientific literature, these groups. And the most prominent one, if you check this literature, are the siloxane oligomers. So here you see some of them. You don't need to look into the details of the structure, but um, the names may appear later on. So there are linear siloxane oligomers. If we start with the L3, that is composed of three subunits. That's why it has the number. L is linear, that's pretty simple. And then if you increase the number, the, the backbone of this molecule gets a little bit longer. So four or five, or it could be even more. Um, and then there are the cyclic siloxane oligomers. And they are called D for a certain reason. I won't explain this. It's a little bit complicated, but there is a reason. So they are called D4 if they have four subunits, D5 if they have five subunits, and so on. And uh, up to D D18 have been measured to migrate from food contact silicones. And there's one rule of thumb, uh, the smaller, the more volatile these molecules are. So um, they behave quite differently if they are smaller than if they are a long chain molecule. And um, as I said, most of the studies describe the, the migration of the siloxane oligomers, so the rather small and volatile molecules. So um, I try to summarize them. There are not many studies. So if you compare it to plastics, you find hundreds and thousands of studies. But if you look at the um, hundreds, maybe not thousands, but um, if you look at silo silicones, you don't find many studies. But still, you can. I try to make some general or summarize some general observations. And um, this will be a quite crowded slide, but you find all the detailed information in the sources on the bottom of the, of the slide. So uh, most studies which I've found, they address the migration of siloxane oligomers, as I said before, and mainly the cyclic oligomers. Compared to the linear, they migrate, migrate at higher levels. The levels of migration usually decreases after repeated cycles. So that means if I test a material and fill in a certain liquid to see what chemicals migrates from the material into the liquid. If I do that again and again, the levels usually decrease. But that's not surprising. That has been observed for many other materials. If I want to know what is in the material, I may do this kind of migration experiment I've just described, but I can also do a harsh experiment using solvents. So I take the material and do an extraction and um, get out much more. And um, there is a study from Denmark where they have tested silicone food contact articles from the Norwegian market. And there they have seen if they perform an extraction, the levels of migrants exceed the proposed action limit. So they are very high. They are higher than they should be. But if they do only migration, then the, the levels stay below these proposed action limits. And that's also not very new because extraction is usually is done under much harder conditions. A very new study reported that there are volatile cyclic oligomers um, they could be measured in the air if you bake 
in the silicon mold. And also the silicon molds emit higher levels of particles into the air than the metal molds, which the group has used as control. Some older studies, which are also cited in the dossier, they say that silicon baking molds can lose substantial amounts of their masses during use at high temperatures, so more than 0.5%. And inter interestingly, these um, losses are somehow compensated by the integration of fat into the material. So if I bake some cake or some whatever else I can put in such a mold, then the fat can also go into the form and this of course may cause some hygienic problems. And um, what I found very interesting, only very few studies address the migration of non-silicone substances. But I found one from the year 2012 where um, non-silicone migrants from silicone baby bottles were tested. So um, this was been or has been published by the Joint Research Center of the EU and um, they have tested all different sorts of baby bottles but also um, silicone baby bottles. And um, they have used these bottles, filled them with 50% ethanol and incubated them for two hours at 70 degrees and then they identified all different kinds of substances including phthalates, DIP, DIPN, benzophenone and naphthalenes. So the last three are related to um, printed, subs, or printed food contact materials and they also found quite high levels of aldehydes. And concluded, the authors concluded that this material generally showed migration of a greater number and extent of substances than polypropylene, which I found very surprising, but there is not much work going on on these, um, on these non-silicon migrants. Um, so Karen also mentioned in the beginning, we are not only exposed to silicones from um, food contact materials, but of course many other sources exist. And one prominent one is for example, cosmetics. And we don't only consume them by ingestion, but also by inhalation and dermal absorption. However, they, especially the small cyclics, silicones are rather quickly eliminated via breathing. And currently they are included in the Biomonitoring California program where they measure many different people if they carry these cyclic siloxanes in their body. And um, for the non-silicone migrants, I would say we need more data because we don't know what migrates and um, that, that is, in my opinion, a, a knowledge gap. Um, I just look at the time, I will skip the, this slide, but uh, we'll go to the environment and we'll be quick here too. So um, talking about silicones, we also have to consider the environment. And um, if we look at the degradation, these bonds in the backbone, they are rather easy, degradable or, or breakable by organisms and also under certain physical conditions. But these other bonds are not. So um, silicon carbon bonds are quite stable. And um, the fate of incomplete degradation products is rather unknown. So even if they break down in the, in the environment, there may be some other molecules formed which stay. And one last point about recycling. I found that very interesting because when I wrote the dossier, um, it was said that chemical, uh, that silicones cannot be recycled. But now it seems to be a technology available that um, can recycle silicones, so it breaks them down into small pieces which can be used for something else. But uh, I think there are no collection schemes for consumers at the moment and it's not possible to use it widely. So now I come to the conclusion. So these silicones um, we have been talking about are materials with unique properties that can be used for various applications. And they are often strongly promoted as safe and environmental friendly alternative to plastic. However, we should carefully evaluate whether the use of silicones in contact with food may be of concern for human health or the environment, in addition to all the other exposure sources we have. So we need to better understand the properties of known migrants. We have to identify the unknown migrants and consider the fate of silicones at the end of, of their life. And with that, I would like to finish. So I skip this one. And now I think we have some more minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Birgit.
Um, we have two questions here um, about silicones and PFAS. Um, one is, can you compare and contrast these substances to PFAS and oil and grease resistance to food packaging applications? And then um, someone else also was thinking along the same line and saying that, you know, silicones have still more properties to PFAS with respect to water and food, water and grease resistance, as well as high temperature resistance. Are silicones being studied as PFAS replacements? And would it be regrettable substitution? I thought about that when I was preparing the webinar, but I didn't go into the details. But um, so for sure, PFAS are even harder to degrade. So the, the carbon fluorid bonds, usually you cannot break that. So I think they are from from many viewpoints, they are even the nastier molecules. Um, I think I would need to do a little bit more of research to, to talk about the application of the PFAS and the silicones and if they're really comparable or not. So I think they are different in many cases. So PFAS, for example, if we use it in the kitchen, then it's it's in the in the coatings of the pens. There it's a a very strong polymer. If we use it on paper, then of course it's a small molecule, which is um, which can be released much much uh, more easily. Um, so I would prefer to have the silicone coated materials than the PFAS coated materials, especially if we talk about the small molecules PFAS. But that's at the moment not the a very substantial reasoning. So um, I can offer you to come or to, to provide you with more information. Okay. Later uh, on. Uh, there's another question. Um, how do the non silicone migrants get into the silicones? I have no idea. When I looked at them, I thought, what are they doing there? And I don't know, it may be from the production machines or, no, I don't know. Okay. And, um, I think we do not know much about the additives we are actually, which are actually used during production. We, I think it's always difficult to get this information also for plastics and all this, but for silicones, it seems to be even more difficult to get this information. So it could be either contamination or maybe they have been, some of them have been used on purpose, but um, the paper didn't provide the details. Yeah, last week um, we had a, a webinar about silicone wristbands mm -hmm. being used to measure air pollution and pesticides and other things. Is that, I think it's related to the uptake of hydrophobic molecules, exactly. is that also another potential source of contamination? And do we know whether or not those could be migrate to food? Um, I think it's a very good point because especially if you claim that silicones are so inert, if they are inert, then they shouldn't take anything up. So it's in both directions, inertness. So they don't release any chemicals, but they shouldn't take anything up. So if they are inert, um, obviously, they are not as inert as they are claimed by some people because they they interact with the with the environment, and um, I think much more research should be done there. Plus, okay, yeah, if sorry. If phthalates are contaminants, then they have been taken up maybe during processing or whatever. This can happen in, in, under other conditions too. Um, and we had a question about um, I think. I think uh, the the migrants um, that get into the food, do we know a if they bioaccumulate in humans, and b what the health effects might be in humans? Yeah, I skipped that slide. I'm sorry. I I was aware of the time. Uh, I don't know if you can still show it. It's in the in the PDF or in the slides which which have been shared. So they the small cyclic. Um, Siloxanes, they do 
they are PBT, classified as PBT in Europe. So that means they are persistent, so they are bioaccumulative and they are toxic. And they are even classified as very persistent and very bioaccumulative. So yeah, they, they are. And do we know what the health effects are? Um, are there we don't any? know too much about it. So I, I checked some animal studies and it, the results there are quite scattered. So um, if you go back to the slide. Hannah, can you go back to the slide? Well, yeah. Sure, I can pull them okay. back up here. So there have been some, some uh, indications that they can have an effect on fertility in high dose animal toxicity studies. So this is completely different from what we are exposed to on a daily basis. That is, we have to be aware of. There have been some changes in, in some tissues. There have also been changes in hormone levels. Um, there's no indication that they could be genotoxic, but they also have some activity on oh, go back. Yeah. immune modulation. I think it's the next one, Hannah. It's uh, this. This one, yeah. Exactly, this one. So there are, but they are coming from animal studies and from not too many animal studies. And they have been performed under different conditions. So it's, it's really hard to, to conclude on, on these data. But below the second part, this is what I've mentioned. So um, they are persistent bioaccumulative and toxic, the small cyclic substances. But the many other substances which are used, we don't know anything about it, I would say. Okay. Um, we're running a little bit over time, but um, hopefully I want to get one or two more questions in. Someone asked, what are some examples of side chains and their properties? So side chains, yes. Uh, the most common side chain is a methyl group. So it's a C and three hydrogen atoms connected to it. So that's also the side chain in all these D4, D5, D6, and so on in, in many of these substances. But you can also use more complex side chain, uh, chains, uh, a carbon atom, and then maybe uh, another atom which allows the binding to another backbone, or it could also be a phenyl ring so an aromatic compound that would change the, the properties of the material completely. So there are many alkyl and also aromatic organic side chains possible. But the most widely used is the methyl. Okay, we have another question. This one is um, more practical. <laughs> Which is better, a paper liner for baking or silicone bakeware? So it depends on the paper liner. If it's co heavily coated or, or covered with PFAS, mm. then as I said before, my personal choice would be the silicone. But um, yeah, <laughs> we don't know. So it's very difficult. Yes, we don't know. So um, an alternative is just butter or oil. Yeah. Is the environment fate, environmental fate of silicones used in food packaging um, or other bakeware known? Um, there, I think you mentioned there's not very many studies. Um, so the, these uh, cyclic small silicones, there is a little bit known about the environmental fate. So they are found at many places in many in many different animals and different environmental compartments. So that's, I think, part of the classification or that's why, why they have been classified as such. And um, the degradation, so the silicone you use, for example, in kitchen utensils, uh, I think in soil or in water or in any, any environmental compartment, they cannot be degraded. They can be burned, of course but they wouldn't degrade. Um, okay, one last was, question. Okay. Um, are there analytical chemistry methods to measure the silicone levels in human biosamples, urine, blood, et cetera? 
Um, Yes, but I can refer to, uh, I'm happy that I can do this because I just placed it on my table. I can refer to this uh, excellent review by Christoph Rücker and Klaus Kümmerer. I think you have it on your website. I've sent you the, the reference when you prepared for the webinar. It's um, in chemical reviews published in the year 2014 and they give very good um, information about all the, the chemical background of silicones. So if you're interested in the details and the, the methods and where it has been measured and all this, I can strongly recommend this paper. Okay, great. Yeah, if you navigate to our webinar page, there's um, a sidebar where you can find both these slides and other resources that Birgit sent. Um, so I think we've gone over time. Apparently this is a very uh, interesting topic. So thank you so much, and Hannah, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, both of you. Um, thanks, thank you, Karen. We're approaching the end of our webinar today. A video recording of this webinar will be available on the CHE website soon. Tomorrow you will receive an email containing a link to the video. The CHE Alaska Partnership will host its next call on Tuesday, June 27th, and is titled Plastics and Health, The Hidden Costs of a Plastic Planet. To learn more into RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated on upcoming events and more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, which bring you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is health and environment.org. With that, I would like to thank you, uh, thank our speaker, Dr. Goya, once more for taking the time to present today, and to you, Karen, for your excellent moderation. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day. <laughs>